now it's time for David's talk. And I think it's quite fitting that at the very beginning of this uh, conference, we had a talk from Gavin Salam on the physics at a real collider, the LHC. And now we're gonna have a talk from David on the collider some of us wish we had, which is the N equals four supersymmetric conformally invariant collider. So David, can you uh, go ahead, please? Okay. All right, very good. Um, thanks a lot to uh, uh, the organizers for putting on this really amazing conference. Um, it's a unique experience. And uh, thanks to Lance for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, conformal detectors, um, the, the uh, collider that we um, uh, all wish we had. Um, and uh, this talk is based on um, uh, some work done over the past few years and also a couple uh, upcoming uh, projects that will hopefully appear someday. Um, so let me start by defining what I mean by a detector. And actually, I'm, I'm not going to define it. I'm going to start by giving an example. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, see some more complicated examples later. So the simplest example of a detector um, is just the null integral of a local operator. So here uh, we have a local operator O, and it has, um, let's say, spin J. Um, and so we uh, put all the point all the indices in the plus direction and integrate it along x plus. Um, and there's a fancy version of this integral that makes the uh, conformal transformation properties of this kind of integral manifest, um, and that's called the light transform. So uh, the light transform um, of an operator is labeled by uh, a position, x, and uh, a direction, a null direction, z. Um, and the idea is um, uh, you, uh, you take the operator O, and it starts at x, and then you integrate it in the z direction. Um, and here, uh, in this expression, I'm using index-free notation. Um, which is explained below. So the idea of index-free notation is you introduce this null vector z that I'll call a polarization vector. Um, and you contract all the indices of O with z. Um, and then you also integrate O along the z direction. So here's the picture. O starts here um, at a point x, and you integrate it along the z direction. Um, and so the reason this labeling of uh, the integral is nice, the reason it's nice to label the integral in terms of uh, an initial position x and a direction z is that um, this integral suitably interpreted becomes a conformally invariant transform. Um, it's actually, uh, it does an interesting thing. It takes operators with dimension delta and spin j to uh, some non-local operators that transform transform like a primary with dimension one minus j and spin one minus delta. Um, and, um, uh, and I call this transform the light transform. Um, and the point is that packaged in this way, the null integrals of O can be interpreted as a primary operator. And we can think about putting this primary operator in different places. OK, so let me uh, explain the word detector. So the idea of calling this thing a detector comes from uh, going to a particular conformal frame um, where we put um, the starting point of the null integral at spatial infinity. So the integral starts at spatial infinity down here. Um, and you integrate it along future null infinity um, and end at future infinity. Um, and so we're putting the starting point of the integral at spatial infinity. The remaining uh, label that's left is this label z, um, which again is a null direction. And we can parameterize z uh, in this way. And um, so we see that z uh, corresponds to a direction on the celestial sphere, s d minus 2. So um, uh, in this detector frame, uh, the, this example of a detector that we have is a local operator uh, integrated over future null infinity at a particular location on the celestial sphere. Um, and uh, so 
these operators are nice because they're very natural things to measure. So an event shape um, is a type of observable where you have a state psi. Um, and here, uh, we're computing the expectation value in a particular state, but you could also compute transition amplitudes between different states. Um, and sandwiched between the state psi is a bunch of these, um, a bunch of these null integrated operators in the detector frame. So we have a bunch of these operators along null infinity, all at different locations on the celestial sphere, labeled by these polarization vectors z1 through zk. Um, and an example of such an observable is an energy correlator. Um, an energy correlator uh, is where you measure the um, uh, flux of energy at different angles on the celestial sphere in some state. Um, and the operator that measures the flux of energy arriving at some direction on the celestial sphere is the light transform of the stress tensor. So uh, energy correlators are an example of this more general um, event shape. Okay, so um, let's look at an example of one of these null integrated operators and understand um, what it does inside an event shape. So the example that I'll uh, talk about first is just um, a spin J current in a free theory, in a th theory of free bosons. So this is the spin J current. It's just a pair of phi's with a bunch of derivatives, J derivatives between them. Um, and it's a trace of symmetric tensor with spin J. I'm suppressing the indices for simplicity. And I'll call that operator X of J. Um, so um, we can uh, stick the light transform of X of J um, in some expectation value and study the uh, expectation value of it in say a single particle state. Um, and it's natural to go to momentum space for this state. Um, and the fancy reason for that is that um, uh, this operator here is a primary operator at x equals infinity, and therefore it's killed by the translation generators. Just like a primary operator um, at the origin is killed by special conformal generators, this is killed by translations. Um, and um, so that means it preserves momentum. So if we uh, start with a state with some momentum, then um, uh, we get a momentum conserving delta function um, up front. Um, okay, so the matrix element of this uh, detector in a free theory uh, is the following. Um, so there's a delta function that basically fixes the momentum of the particle to be pointing in the z direction. Um, and then the actual value that the detector gives is some kind of weighted integral over the magnitude of the momentum. Um, and in words, uh, what this detector does is it counts particles going into the z direction and it weights them by a power of their energy. Um, so that's in a free theory. And in a free theory, this is a very natural kind of observable to have. You can study you know, whatever particles you want flying up to infinity, you can study the sum of powers of their energy and that's a perfectly nice thing. Um, uh, however, now let's imagine turning on interactions. If we turn on interactions, then this sum of powers of the energy is no longer an IR safe observable. So the, the problem is that you can have a particle propagating out and it can split as it propagates out towards infinity. As it splits, of course, energy is conserved, but powers of energy are not conserved. So this um, uh, trying to measure the flux of powers of energy at infinity is not a well-defined thing in an interacting theory. Um, so of course, this is a familiar phenomenon um, uh, in the amplitudes world. Um, but what I'd like to advocate is a particular point of view on this phenomenon that I find to be really, uh, really useful um, and instructive and leads to a nice physical picture. So to explain that point of view, um, let's think about an analogous situation with local operators. So a local operator is roughly anything you can measure at a point. Um, and um, 
So let's suppose we have some perturbative theory uh, and we start trying to measure a local operator. So we take some kind of product, um, uh, some kind of bare operator, some product of phi's. Um, in perturbation theory, uh, we'll of course encounter UV divergences. Um, and the resolution to this problem of UV divergences is of course that we have to renormalize our operator. Um, and what the renormalized operators are telling you is that really the, th the theory is trying to tell you what the good measurements are. The thing that you tried to measure, the bare operator that you tried to measure, was not a good measurement in that theory. Instead, the theory has some set of theory dependent um, local operators that are really good local operators that you should be measuring. And any other computation that you do, any other observable, should be re-expressed in terms of the good local operators of the theory. So in other words, you have, if you're working with some, some theory, you have to let the theory tell you what its observables are, what its local operators are. And then once you accept that point of view, once you um, uh, realize that there's some space of good local operators that are um, uh, well-defined, um, then it reveals a whole lot of uh, beautiful structure that can be very useful. One example of a structure that follows once you've identified the correct space of local operators is the operator product expansion. That's something I'll talk about a little later. Um, and one of the nice, one of the beautiful things about local operators in conformal field theories is that we actually have a non-perturbative understanding of the space of local operators. Um, they can be characterized as the Hilbert space of the theory on um, SD minus one. And that's the point of view of radio quantization. So there's this nice Hilbert space interpretation um, uh, of what a local operator means. And one of the nice things about having this non-perturbative characterization of a local operator is it gives you confidence that if you're working in perturbation theory and you encounter some kind of bare operator that has UV divergences, it gives you confidence that if you systematically renormalize these UV divergences, then the objects that you get should be describing or coming closer to something that's non-perturbatively well-defined. So let's now look at the example of a detector. So what I, I'd like to define a detector as roughly anything that you can weight a cross-section with. So before we were talking about the example of weighting uh, cross-sections with powers of energy of particles going in different directions, but we'll see much more general uh, um, uh, types of things that you can weight cross-sections with a little later in the talk. Now, if you just sit down with your theory and you try to write down the most naive detector that you can, for example, the, the one that, um, that weights particles by the square of their energies, then you'll encounter IR divergences. And the reason these are IR divergences is roughly that your detector is a primary operator at infinity instead of being at the origin. So UV divergences become IR divergences. And of course, this, what this means is that the theory is trying to tell you what its good detectors are. Um, and uh, so you should renormalize your detector. And once you renormalize the detector, you've discovered now the good, the, the class of good observables that you can, that are really well defined um, when you compute weighted cross sections with them. And of course, the set of good detectors is a theory dependent thing. You have to let the theory tell you what its detectors are. Um, and once you take this point of view, uh, you can now ask about relationships between um, good, non-perturbatively well-defined detectors. Um, and that's uh, one of the ideas behind the light ray OPE. And I should say that the light ray OPE that I'll discuss in this talk um, is probably not the most general type of relationship that you can derive between detectors, but it's one example. Now, one thing that is really missing in this story um, is uh, an analog of radial quantization. Uh, a Hilbert space interpretation that gives us a complete non-perturbative characterization of the space of detectors. And indeed, the question of the full space of detectors in a theory is, is an important open question. And I'll just talk about um, some examples of, of uh, detectors, but I won't be able to give you a complete uh, abstract definition like we can with local operators. Okay. Um, so, uh, one of the things that, that um, tells us that there exists a rich space of detectors um, is analyticity and spin. Uh, 
um, this notion that detectors lie on Reggie trajectories that are analytic in spin J. Now, uh, to identify um, uh, the Reggie trajectories in a free theory is pretty easy. Um, so remember, in a free theory, these detectors were the detector that I described, the light transform of xj, was weighting particles by e to the j minus 1. And we can consider, um, now, because energy is positive, we can consider any complex j. Um, so in a free theory, it's perfectly beautiful to consider such a thing. Now, as I explained, when we turn on interactions, this will generically not be an IR safe observable. Um, but um, it turns out that uh, analyticity in spin, so the, the requirement that um, uh, detectors lie in Reggie trajectories, gives you confidence that actually you should be able to define a well-defined detector with non-integer spin. Um, and in um, uh, a paper a couple of years ago that I actually talked about uh, at Amplitudes um, two years ago um, uh, with Peter Krauchuk, we gave a uh, non-perturbative construction of detectors with non-integer spin. And the picture for these detectors is um, that they lie on a two Frouchy plot. So I'm gonna astonish everyone with my ability to spell Frouchy. Um, so the natural coordinates in this plot are um, uh, delta minus d over 2 uh, versus the spin j. And um, the, uh, some of the distinguished points on this plot are the local operators. So there's the light transform of the stress sensor, which sits at spin 2 and uh, dimension d. And there are light transforms of other local operators in the theory. But the claim is that actually these, uh, these light transforms of local operators lie in Reggie trajectories, and you can interpolate between them. And that's what this, funny, this object funny O represents. It's an interpolation between the, local, the light transforms of local operators. Um, and um, you can write down an expression for this funny O such that when you set J equal to an even integer, it becomes the light transform of a local operator. So this is an example of a more general set of detectors that exist in any non-perturbative CFT. Now, again, we don't know the full space of detectors, but this is at least some larger space than just the one that I started out with. So in this talk, I'm going to try to talk about two aspects of um, the space of detectors and the physics of detectors and CFTs. And I actually have no idea when I started. Maybe someone can type it in the chat window. We'll see how. Um, how much time I have to talk. About. I think you're about 15 minutes in. Okay, but thanks frankly, a lot. There, there aren't any planes to catch. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the light ray OPE. Um, and uh, if you think about um, detectors as being labeled by points on the celestial sphere, this is a very natural question to ask. So we have an SD minus two, and each detector is a point on SD minus two. Um, and the Lorentz symmetry of the theory um, is the conformal group on this celestial sphere. Um, let me draw this dashed line here so it doesn't look too much like a cookie monster. Oh, maybe make it, made it worse. Um, so it's natural to ask um, if there's some kind of expansion where two detectors get close to each other. It looks a little bit like having a pair of local operators in a D minus two dimensional theory. So can we, um, can we describe that expansion? And physically, this expansion would correspond to um, uh, an expansion in the angle between two detectors. So for example, the angle between two calorimeters in a collider. Um, and um, so this looks like, so, so we have a product of two light transforms. That's what we're asking about, a product of these two light transforms. Um, and um, this looks like a new kind of detector. But uh, an interesting um, thing that we found is that this product can actually be expanded in a convergent expansion in um, the detectors I described on the previous page, namely the ones that appear on the Chu Frouchy plot, these Reggie trajectories. Um, and the claim is that uh, this product of light transforms has an expansion. Um, the, uh, the expansion is in powers of the angle between the detectors. Um, and the objects appearing in the expansion 
are these um, funny uh, new light ray operators um, at particular values of j. And um, to read them off, what you can do is look at the true Frauchi plot down here. Um, so the local operators, so here what I'm showing are even spin Reggie trajectories. Um, and this is in the example of the uh, OPE of two energy detectors. Remember that E is two times L, the light transform of the stress tensor. Um, so uh, these even spin Reggie trajectories have uh, null integrals of local operators on them at every even spin. So that's what the black dots are. And the claim for the light ray OPE is that what you're supposed to do is draw uh, horizontal lines at odd spins, um, and then the intersections of these horizontal lines with each Reggie trajectory become the terms in this expansion. So the little red crosses are the terms that appear in the expansion. And this is a non-perturbative prediction in a conformal field theory for the uh, um, behavior of uh, a product of these two um, null integrated operators as the angle between them gets small. And you can see that you get these non-trivial powers um, of the angle. The non-trivial powers of the angle are given by um, taking the dimensions of local operators analytically continuing them in spin and then evaluating them at these very particular spins. Um, so let me just give a sketch of how the argument for this OPE works. Um, so the idea is you can start with um, uh, a general expression for one of these uh, light ray operators, one of these funny O's. They're given by smearing a product of two local operators against a, a special kernel. Um, so roughly speaking, there's, there's this uh, kernel that one can write down, it's very explicitly. Um, and you integrate O1 and O2 against this kernel. And what the kernel does is there's some kind of, there's some kind of light ray and the kernel is supported in a neighborhood of the light ray. And you have O1 living out here and O2 living out here. And you smear them around in such a way that you pick out a particular thing that transforms with quantum numbers delta and j. And this kernel is analytic in j. So you can do this um, funny smearing for any complex j and it defines some kind of weird object. And this weird object, as I said before, is the thing that um, gives these Reggie trajectories. Now the idea for deriving the light ray OPE is to study how this weird object behaves at these um, odd values of j. So remember, this is an even spin Reggie trajectory, but now we take it and we evaluate it at odd j. Um, and the nice thing that happens is that this kernel uh, localizes onto the null cone for um, both points x1 and x2. So at these very special values of j, um, what you end up with is instead of integrals over x1 and x2 in some neighborhood that, that has support um, in d dimensions, um, you end up with an integral over x1 and x2 uh, on the null cone. And this integral smears x1 and x2 in some funny way on the null cone, but you can undo this smearing using harmonic analysis. Um, so the idea is you collect together enough examples of these null cone localized kernels, you can add them together in such a way that you reconstruct just two um, light rays at specific uh, angles. Um, and so turning that around, you get an expression for the product of these two null integrated operators in terms of some sum of these funny objects at these special values of J. Um, and um, so uh, now the, in our first paper on this subject, um, we uh, described um, some terms in the light ray OPE and these were terms that are maybe more familiar to those um, who know about the work of Hoffman and Malvasena. Um, so they studied an example of the light ray OPE in N equals four superring mills, and they found that the leading term in the OPE is controlled by some kind of spin J equals three light ray operators. Um, and an interesting surprise is that actually higher spin, um, higher J's appear um, in the OPE. Um, and um, uh, that's a bit funny, and I'm gonna explain um, how that happens uh, in a little bit. Um, now, 
before I do that, I want to give a very concrete example of the kind of result that comes from this. So if you have an operator product expansion, you can use it inside observables. Um, and so a, a nice observable is an energy correlator in a scalar state um, and um, in n equals four supering mills. So this is this example will be n equals four supering mills. Um, so uh, so here we're computing a two point energy cor correlator in some state and we can do the OPE between the um, energy detectors. And that gives an expansion for this uh, uh, two point correlator in a cross ratio um, that I'll call zeta. Um, so this energy correlator is some function of zeta and the claim is that zeta, this function of zeta has a non-perturbative expansion in special functions called celestial blocks. And the way this non-perturbative expansion comes about, it's, it's the same way that the conformal block expansion comes about in a conformal field theory. You take your two operators, you uh, do the OPE between them, and you get uh, a bunch of terms that are controlled by conformal invariants. Um, and what's left over is a sum over some um, uh, spectrum of dimensions in the theory. Um, so the claim is that uh, this energy correlator has a non-perturbative expansion in these special functions, which are just two of one hypergeometric functions. And the spectrum appearing in this expansion are the uh, light ray operators at J equals three. Um, the reason the higher Js don't appear uh, in this particular observable is something I'll explain in a moment. Um, so uh, this gives a, um, uh, an infinite number of predictions for um, this uh, energy two point correlator. And it's something that uh, you can check using some really spectacular calculations that I should have list listed here of perturbative energy correlators in n equals four, um, and also at strong coupling. And um, at the same time we put out this result, there were also some uh, really nice analyses of uh, leading terms in the OPE, um, light ray OPE, that uh, also arrived at the leading term in this uh, expression. So that's a, that's a very concrete um, prediction, at least in the context of a conformal field theory. Um, and one of the things that I want to talk about um, today is um, uh, the higher J terms in the light ray OPE, which I think are, are, are new. Um, so the idea is that these higher J terms um, have to do with uh, what, I'll, what I'll call transverse spin. And I'll explain the physical meaning of transverse spin in a second. But first I wanna explain why the higher G terms are a bit surprising and interesting. Um, so if you look at a product of these light transformed operators, one of the first things you can do is use symmetries to constrain what can appear on the right hand side. Um, and there's a particular dilatation symmetry, which is essentially dilatations around the point at spatial infinity that tells you that the things that appear have to look like light transforms of something with, with this special value of spin. So you can ask how do other values of the spin appear? Um, and it turns out that um, uh, there exists some special conformally invariant differential operators that you should think of as being analogous to the operator that appears in the conservation law for a conserved current. So this uh, differential operator is famously only conformally invariant when it acts on something with precisely the right quantum numbers. It turns out that the quantum numbers appearing in this light ray OPE are precisely such that this funny differential operator makes sense and is conformally invariant. Um, and the role of this differential operator is that it flips around some of the uh, boxes on the Young diagram of the thing it acts on. And it basically turns um, uh, spin big J into transverse spin little j. And so um, uh, you can uh, find a place for um, uh, this differential operator acting on um, other light ray operators inside the light ray OPE. And indeed it does appear. Um, and so let me explain physically what this actually does. So um, transverse spin is conjugate to a rotation of two detectors around each other on the celestial sphere. So here's an example, we have two detectors they're separated by some uh, angle theta one two, and that's the thing that controls the expansion and the separation, uh, the, the angle between the two detectors. But there's also a thing I can do, which is rotate them around each other. Um, and uh, this kind of rotation doesn't matter if you're evaluating 
the correlator in a scalar state in a rotationally invariant state. But more gen in more general states, this kind of rotation matters. And um, transverse spin little j controls the dependence on this rotation angle. Um, so one of the predictions is that if you were to study event shapes in study energy correlators in non-rotationally invariant states, then um, in the small angle limit, you'll find um, uh, the spectrum of light ray operators with uh, other values of J. And this is a very concrete thing that I think would be nice to check in perturbative examples. Okay. Um, uh, the next story I, I want to talk about um, is uh, um, more related to perturbation theory, um, which is a question about what, what the space of detectors looks like in the Wilson-Fisher theory. Um, so uh, there's a very interesting detector, which is the one that sits at the bottom of the leading Reggie trajectory. Um, and uh, it, um, it's appropriate to call this detector the Pomeron because it controls the Reggie limit of correlation functions um, and, um, uh, and amplitudes. Um, and one of the nice things about this perspective of uh, light ray operators is it lets you say what, exactly what kind of object the Pomeron is. I would say it's not a particle, um, it's not a local operator, it's a light ray operator, or it's an example of one of these detectors. And uh, what I want to talk about next is a, a concrete expression for the Pomeron in the Wilson-Fisher theory. Um, Okay, so uh, to start, let's talk about the free theory. Um, so in the free theory, um, the, there is this straight line trajectory, which we've already talked about. It's given by light transforms of higher spin currents. And it's useful to parameterize it in terms of nu instead of j. So remember nu I defined as um, delta minus d over two. Um, so uh, the vertex for this um, operator is something I wrote on a previous slide. And here I'm just writing it again in terms of nu. It um, detects particles propagating out in a particular direction and weights them by some power of their energy. Um, and the thing I want to point out is that this operator is local on the celestial sphere. Um, it sits at a point on the celestial sphere. Now there's this other trajectory going in the other direction and it's related by a left-right flip called the shadow transform. Um, so we can uh, apply the shadow transform to this first trajectory and we get some other um, object here, which is a new kind of detector. Um, and instead of only counting particles that propagate out to a particular direction, it counts particles that propagate out in all directions and it weights them by some uh, power of their, some combination of their energy and their angle. Um, and so this is a, some kind of non-local detector. Um, and the interesting and surprising thing that has to happen um, or that we expect to happen is that these two trajectories, one of them local on the celestial sphere and one of them non-local on the celestial sphere, uh, um, recombine when we turn on interactions. So in the free theory, um, they cross at 45 degrees. Um, and in the interacting theory, it's expected, the lower is that they should recombine. Um, and this is precisely an example of the same kind of thing that happens um, in uh, N equals four superior mills, where the BFKL trajectory, which is some horizontal trajectory on the true Fraji plot, and, the, uh, and a 45 degree trajectory recombine when you turn on interactions. Um, and so we'd like to understand this recombination in more detail um, in the Wilson-Fisher theory um, because it's, it's simpler. Um, and I think that the lesson that we learned in this case will also apply to other examples like gauge theories. Okay, so um, the question is all about what happens right at the origin um, where nu equals zero. So let's set nu equal to zero in our two trajectories and see what happens. So in the first one, we get um, something that is perfectly okay. Um, it's again, one of these detectors that counts particles going in a particular direction. Um, and uh, in the other expression, we get something that you have to kind of stare at a little bit um, in order to see uh, what the issue is. And if you squint a lot and stare at it, um, you'll realize that um, the expression that you get um, is actually not well-defined as a distribution. 
So it's important that all of these quantities be well-defined as distributions so that we can integrate them against test functions of Z and P um, and get real observables. And it turns out that the uh, function appearing here is not a good distribution. And it has to do with this power here, which basically makes the quantity here into something, I guess I can be more precise. It looks more like, it looks something like one over the angle um, uh, between the two things to the D minus two. And this is supposed to be integrated um, uh, over a D minus two dimensional space. So it's, it's a bad distribution in the, same sex, in the same sense that one over X is a bad distribution. You can't integrate one over X against the test function and get a finite quantity. Um, and so we actually, so we actually have not identified the, uh, what, what the operator is on this shadow trajectory at new equals zero. Um, and to identify it, we need to uh, fix this distribution here. And the way to do it for one over X is you go from one over X to this um, uh, regularized version of one over X, which is defined by basically subtracting the log divergence when you integrate against it. Um, and there's a funny property that this regularized one over X has, which is that it actually doesn't scale homogeneously anymore. If you rescale X, then you get a shift by a logarithm and the shift is proportional to a delta function. So you can try to take this distribution that appears in B tilde and replace it with the regularized version. And if you do that, you encounter a whole bunch of problems and you have to fix these problems one by one. And um, you end up with the following expression. So this expression um, comes from uh, a few things. So first of all, you need dimensional analysis to work. So you would need to stick in a one over mu uh, to go with your momentum. Um, but um, once you've stuck in a one over mu and used this regularized uh, distribution, um, there's another problem, which is that this thing that you've defined actually doesn't transform, it isn't homogeneous in Z anymore. And that actually means it doesn't transform irreducibly under the Lorentz group. So you need to add another thing that makes the whole thing homogeneous in Z. And here's the interesting part. Um, to get homogeneity in, in Z, you have to add something that looks like the original trajectory, but with a logarithm. So this looks a lot like um, uh, the um, original 45 degree trajectory, except for this funny log in there. And the claim is that this object is actually well-defined. It's a well-defined distribution. It, it, it dimensional analysis makes sense and it transforms irreducibly under the Lorentz group. But we had to pay a price to write down this object, which is that we had to introduce a scale. Um, and introducing this scale means that there's actually, uh, what we have now is a logarithmic multiplet under rescalings. So um, under a dilatation, this thing mixes with, um, so this thing, which this, let's see. So this object that I wrote down here, which represents that trajectory, mixes with the other trajectory via this um, term with the delta function in it. So basically already, so this is already an analysis at tree level. We haven't done any loops yet. The claim is that at tree level, there's logarithmic mixing between these multiplets. Um, and the mixing in particular mixes uh, a non-local thing on the celestial sphere with a local thing on the celestial sphere. Um, and now it's maybe not too surprising how these things can recombine. At loop level, this logarithmic representation splits into two normal representations. And that's just a perturbative calculation you can do. You can renormalize this monster um, uh, and renormalize the uh, other um, thing and you get some anomalous dimension matrix. You diagonalize the anomalous dimension matrix and you get um, these two different operators sitting at new equals zero. And so the claim is that the Pomeron of the Wilson-Fisher theory is a particular linear combination of this object B0 tilde prime um, with uh, the traditional 45 degree trajectory that diagonalizes the, um, the dilatation operator. Okay, so those were a couple stories about the space of detectors. And I hope to have convinced you, first of all, the space of detectors is important because it's the theory trying to tell us something. The theory wants us to know what um, the good observables are and we should listen to it and figure out um, uh, what they are. Um, and um, 
So, but on the other hand, this space of detectors is a bit mysterious because we don't have a non-perturbative characterization of it as we do for local operators. So I think it's important to explore this chu frachi plot in more examples um, uh, at higher loops, in simple theories, more complicated theories, and understand all the structures that can appear in this um, plot. Um, I talked about the light ray OPE, and a natural question is whether the light ray OPE um, can be generalized to um, uh, multi-point event shapes. Can you do repeated operator product expansions? Um, and can it work in non-conformal theories? Um, Non-conformal theories um, uh, actually have a lot of the structure that I've already talked about in that they still have this conformal group on the celestial sphere. That's, of course, the Lorenz group. And it's still there. And it means that it's still natural to decompose uh, energy correlators in non-conformal theories into celestial blocks, the exact same celestial blocks that I talked about um, before. Um, there are other things that uh, will um, potentially break in non-conformal theories. But I think that um, these lessons from the conformal theories, um, one of the lessons is that this, there should be a good space of detectors. I think even in the non-conformal context, and we should try to figure out what it is, the only thing that would break is that in the conformal case, there's a nice connection between the local operator spectrum and the detector spectrum basically because the detector is given by null integrating a local operator and then sticking it at infinity. In a non-conformal theory, renormalizing an operator at infinity is different from renormalizing an operator that's not at infinity. And so you might expect the spectrum of detectors to be different from the spectrum of local operators. But they should still both be nice, well-defined spaces um, that we should think about. Um, and um, of course, a, a dream here from a conform conformal field theorist's point of view is to be able to take our favorite detector like the LHC, um, and re-expand it in the uh, objects that are nicest for the theory we're interested in. We should ask the theory, okay, so the LHC is some big product of calorimeters. Um, we should ask the theory what its, um, what its detectors are um, and re-expand this product of calorimeters in terms of those natural detectors, um, and that should make manifest uh, many of the properties of the observables that we see. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, David, for a great concluding talk. And uh, the floor is now open for questions. I see Pedro Vieira has a question. Pedro, could you unmute and ask your question, please? Uh, hi, David. Hi, Pedro. Uh, just one question. Uh, can you go to this plot where you show the spectrum and then you have odd and even spins? Yeah. So, so it looks like you. Let me try to understand uh, from a very basic point of view. We know that the, the, for each even spin, we have a physical operator. For each odd spin, a priori, we have nothing. But you are saying that these odd values are also important. So is there something yeah. we should look after? Say, if I have n equals 4, I can, in principle, analytically continue in spin. Is there something interesting that one should look for, say, in the solution of n equals 4 happening at odd spins? Um. That's a good question. So, so the, the fact that the odd spins appear here um, is related to a, a shortening. Well, so let me talk about the local operators first, the even spins. So you can ask what's special about the even spin point on points on these trajectories. And it turns out that they satisfy a kind of shortening condition. Um, the, the shortening condition um, uh, roughly, roughly states that if you were to undo the light transform, which we, you can't actually do, but if you if you could undo the light transform, then you would find something that's polynomial in its polarization vector. So that can be translated into a kind of shortening condition that the even spin operators obey. Um, so so even spin. Um, there's some uh, funny differential operator uh, acting on that thing, which gives zero. And then the idea is that um, at odd spins, what happens is um, uh, you can again define these funny differential operators, but um, they don't kill the operator anymore. Instead, this is some kind of primary descendant. So it's a derivative of a primary, but it's also a descendant. So it's telling you that the, the conformal multiplet associated with the odd spins actually has some interesting submultiplet. Um, and um, it's the, it's the primary descendant, it's the, the primary of that submultiplet that fills out the light ray OPE. Um, 
and I have no idea how this would be reflected in the in the um, uh, um, in the quantum spectral curve or whatever for n equals four, but I, I I feel that there should be some I mean some role that these shortening conditions uh, play, but I don't know. Uh, Nima has a question. Hey, David, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, actually, a, a couple of, uh, uh, a, a, a few basic questions. Um, one of them is that, it, I mean, it really feels like these, like the light ray operators should be the most fundamental operators in the theory. Um, one simple question is, so let's say I give you all correlation functions for the uh, uh, light ray, you don't know what they all are, but let, for all the detectors are, but let's say I gave you, um, uh, imagine that you had all of them. Uh, uh, do you think you could reconstruct correlation functions of local operators from that information? Like you might think when the light rays intersect uh, that, that you learn something about a local operator at the intersection point, that you could use intersections to tell you something about local operators. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So one thing that, um, uh, one thing that comes to mind that is slightly less sophisticated is um, if you take two light ray operators and you try to stick them at the same uh, point, which is what we're doing, sometimes you can get divergences if you try to put them at the same point and those divergences will be associated with local operators at those points. So you can, you can at least stick light ray operators end to end and try to create local operators in that right. way. That, 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 that's sort of what, yeah, okay. I see, instead of yeah. making them intersect, just put them at, uh, end to end, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. So you, right. Can, you can at least do that. But yeah, actually, I mean, the analysis of these kinds of things that we've done so far is very limited in terms of the kinematics that you can have. And once you have these non-local objects, you can arrange them in all sorts of crazy ways. And all, we, all I've talked about here is, is the end-to-end -end case, and in particular, the end-to-end -end case where there's no local operators appearing at the, uh, when, you, when you take the limit. But yeah, they're, they're all, I don't know, that, that's an interesting question about, I mean, if the, if the things cross, then um, uh, that, well, that certainly should be related to Reggie physics, but but you could have a mixture of local operators appearing and and Reggie physics. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and uh, well, I, uh, maybe one 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 more question. I mean, one of the things that uh, uh, um, what, when when we have correlation functions of local operators, uh, that's something that's not supposed to survive when we when we turn on gravity, famously. So we we, we talk about uh, scattering amplitudes as the observable in flat space. Uh, 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 the only kind of observable we can talk about in flat space for that reason. But it's always uh, uh, bothered me, well, bothered anyone who's thought about it, that we could imagine, for example, coupling a conformal field theory to gravity. Um, and then naively in, in that setup, there's no scattering amplitudes either because, uh, because there's no official scattering amplitude for the conformal theory and then uh, anyway. So the, the, the question is, what are the observables in a theory like that? Um, do you think these uh, expectation values of light ray operators might be things that consistently deform when you turn on gravity? Uh, yeah, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I, I, I think because they, they, I mean, they, they don't suffer from, from the same problem, so they're they're more like asymptotic observables, but they're not amplitudes, which uh, don't make sense for officially. I mean, perfectly precisely for conformal theory. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as you know, particularly if you worked, say, in five dimensions, you could imagine perturbatively renormalizing light ray operators in the presence of gravity, and I don't really see what would go wrong. That, that's really interesting. Thank you. Sure. There's a question from David Broadhurst. David, do you want to ask your question? So, so David, thank you very much for your impeccable spelling of Steve Frouch's name. Steve is still with us, I believe. Uh, the great thing about the Chu, uh, the, the Chu-Frouchy plot was that it was straight. I mean, all the way up to spin 17 over two. Uh, and that is the origin of the only string theory I understand, the theory of the hadronic string where alpha prime is one over one GeV squared. How does that relate to the parabolas and the picture that you have in front of you? Oh, good, yeah. Okay, so um, the, the, the plot looks different in uh, at, at weak and strong coupling and um, drawing a, I'm drawing a cartoon of something sort of in between. So at weak coupling, let's say in N equals four supering mills, um, the shoe frashy plot uh, looks as follows. So there's a BFKL trajectory. Maybe I'll switch here. So there's a BFKL trajectory, which is a horizontal trajectory um, at spin one. Um, and um, uh, then there are um, 
there are straight line 45 degree trajectories. Um, let's do that. And this stress tensor is up here, let's say. So that's it, weak coupling. Um, and then, so if you wanted to ask what the leading rigid trajectory is, it's actually this funny um, discontinuous thing at weak coupling in the gauge theory. And then when we turn on interactions, um, the, um, the stress sensor, of course, doesn't move. Um, and what happens is that these, this 45 degree trajectory and the horizontal trajectory recombine, probably through a similar um, mechanism to what I described for the Pomeron and the Wilson-Fisher theory. Um, and so you end up with, a, and so that happens down here, and then out here you get anomalous dimensions, which means, so, so remember this axis is delta minus d over two. Mm -hmm. So anomalous dimensions mean that the trajectory over here moves out a little bit. So it sort of becomes a bit smoother and looks like that when you turn on any directions. And in the strong coupling limit, at least in the planar theory, this thing flattens more and becomes more and more parabola-like and, uh, and looks like that. So this is, this is g small, this is g big. And the, the red thing is g equals zero. Thank you. Sure. There's a question from Kurt Hinter Bickler. Kurt, do you mm -hmm. want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Do you, do you know what kind of conformal representations these detector operators live in? Do they live in Vermo modules like local operators do? Yes, um, that's a great question. So um, uh, the idea, so local operators, um, uh, local operators live in generalized Verma modules, which you can think of as being induced representations um, from uh, a representation of the Lorenz group. Um, so you have to give a finite dimensional representation in the Lorenz group and you have to give a, um, uh, a scaling dimension and you induce this up to the full conformal group. Um, so that's the local case. Um, and um, uh, the idea for these non-local operators is that they, um, and actually let me write another, uh, another thing that I find helpful to think about. So for local operators, it's very useful to think about their representation in terms of a sort of generalized Young diagram for, for uh, the conformal group. Um, so you have a bunch of rows of the Young diagram. Um, and the first row is minus delta, minus the scaling dimension. Um, and um, uh, the next row would be the spin, and then the next row would be the transverse spin, and, and so on, the thing I call transverse spin. And for local operators, um, uh, only the first row can be non-integer length. Um, and the, reason, the way to think about the minus delta is if you think about a local operator with dimension that's a negative integer, then it actually becomes a polynomial in position, and therefore a finite dimensional representation of the conformal group. So the first row is minus delta, and the and in the um, and in the local case, uh, j is an integer. Um, to describe these non-local operators, all you have to do is um, allow j to be non-integer. Um, so it's sort of like now you treat spin the same way you already were treating the dimension. Um, and are still unitary representations? Uh, no, um, no, they're, they're, they're not. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're not unitary representations. And that means that you can have phenomena like, um, uh, uh, like these primary descendants that I talked about, funny relationships between things that naively transform like primaries. Um, also, the, the light transform, you can also see from the, the light transform, the way it changes quantum numbers, um, it uh, takes something that might have unitary quantum numbers to something that doesn't. Uh -huh. Okay, so doesn't that mean there can't be any kind of isomorphism to a Hilbert space or anything like that? Well, yeah, it certainly means that uh, radio, radial quantization doesn't work for these objects. So that's maybe something I should have said when I, in, when I talked about the light ray OPE. So in, in the case of local operators, the usual way to argue for the OPE is um, to uh, think in terms of radial quantization. You have 
some ball with two operators inside and you just say, okay, let's do the path integral over the interior of the ball and ask what's the state on the outside. And then by the state operator correspondence, that state on the outside corresponds to some kind of operator. Um, that's the like zero line argument for the OPE for local operators. I don't know of an analogous argument for this light ray OPE. And the way we had to derive the light ray OPE was by sort of starting with something that we feel like we understand, the local operator spectrum, and then doing a bunch of mathematical contortions to kind of move towards um, this limit that we're interested in. It would be great if there were a more conceptual, uh, efficient way to argue for this expansion, but we don't have one. Thanks. Hey, I can't resist adding a little comment about the relevance to, of this to real colliders. I mean, observables like the energy energy correlator have been studied in electron positron collisions for, for many years. And <clears throat> although QCD is not conformally invariant, if you measure it at short distances, the coupling isn't running too fast. And so I think uh, a lot of these ideas can be useful. There's this, uh, uh, the E plus E minus source is polarized in some way. And so you could also look at these transverse uh, spin rotations, although that's not something the experimentalists have done that I know of. They tend to sort of integrate over the incoming beam direction. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in principle, they could look at that. And the LHC, of course, is a much more asymmetric environment and, and correlations like this can play a role both, both at the event shape global level and also you can bring um, you know, these light ray operators together and the study of multiple switch operators, I think, is just starting. There's some work by Ian Moult and Washing Zhu in the LHC context where these can be things to diagnose jet uh, substructure and try to maybe tell the difference between jets from different sources. So I think there's a bright future for trying to apply some of these ideas in the, let's say, real world. So, uh, <laughs> You can comment on that if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, that, uh, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, yeah, the results by, um, uh, uh, about the multi-point energy correlators are, um, are already very, very interesting. There really hasn't been a lot done on that. And, um, I think it's interesting to think about that, um, the calculations that have been done in this language. Um, we, we have not, we, we've been, trying pretty hard and haven't really come up with a great story for multi-point OPEs um, in this language. So I think perturbative um, examples could be really instructive. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, yeah, I think that's, I agree, that's a really exciting direction. And um, uh, yeah, and if they could measure these, these things in polarized states, that would be great. So uh, I've never closed a Zoom conference before. But I, I think uh, I should ask Anastasia if she would like to have the last word. Oh, um, yes, thank you so much again to all the speakers, participants, and uh, the organizing committee, and see you all at the next virtual talk. And I th I'm going to unmute all so we can give a really uh, huge uh, reaction to uh, Anastasia. And all of you. Yeah.